Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to today. It is the 19th of March. Oh my goodness. We are over halfway through this month and we're getting closer to April. In just a couple days, it'll be spring. And what a fabulous way to end this week as well as launch us into spring. Hey, Liz Rodriguez, I was just thinking about you the other day. I love you. And so, we are getting ready for an exciting broadcast. It's one of my favorite teachings. Hey, Helene. Hey, Sarah. God bless y'all. Thank you for joining in. So good to have you. And we are going, thank you, Helene. We are going to get started. Hey, Erica. God bless you. Hey, Barbara Voigt. Thank you for joining in. Hey, Margaret Hold, I love you. And oh my goodness, while I'm thinking about it, this is so funny. I have to tell you how awesome God is because God shows you, Holy Spirit shows you things to come. Uh, John 16, 13, amen. Thank you, Liz. And so about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, I kept telling Rich, I said, Rich, everywhere I turn around, I keep seeing Kentucky. And I just feel like we're going to be in Kentucky this year. And every time I just turned around, it was Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. And I did get a message uh, three nights ago from one of my precious young lady sisters down in, uh, up there in Kentucky that I ministered at her house when I ministered also at Margaret's place up in Lexington. And she said, Robin, I feel like God wants you to come to Kentucky this year. And I'm like, yes. Hey, Renee, I cannot wait to see you next weekend. And that reminds me, I'll be ministering in Missouri next weekend, and I cannot wait. It's Passover weekend. What an awesome time to minister. And Kentucky this year, and also I hope to do, thank you Jesus, our conferences, which will be called a retreat this year. And it will be based on my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, and I will have workbooks for those that are attending. And we truly want it to be a retreat, a place of shalom and drawing near to God with a repentant heart. Amen. So let us get started on our teaching and let us end this week in a phenomenal way with truth. What better way than to end a week than with truth? Amen. God, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that you chose to use us, just the weakest things of this world, to inhabit, to bring your presence. And God, we just ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as your word unfolds before us and we see your fruit, that we're able to taste of the goodness of who you are, Father, as Jesus interprets you to us through the word because he is the word your son and that you just bring abundant life and that that life is the light of men and women amen in jesus name amen so today we are doing one of my favorite scriptures which i know is one of your favorite scriptures again for me this is a core scripture <clears throat> I just have certain scriptures that are core scriptures for me. And this is that, and I know it is for many of you out there. So what is the scripture? It is Jeremiah, you know what I'm going to say, 29, 11 through 13. I love this scripture because when I was an alcoholic, this was one of the particular scriptures God would have me speak over and over and over. And I just grabbed a hold of it. And I came to know that God had a hope for me. He didn't want harm to be my portion, but my portion wasn't expected in. And so we're going to look at Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And I'm going to share some of the things that I wrote about this particular scripture, which I unpacked in Rev 22.2, which is on Amazon. 
God's watchmen, the tree of life, God's life guards. Amen. When you truly come to know the life of Jesus. Amen, Liz. Amen. Me too, woman of God. When you truly come to know the life of freedom that God has for you in truth. John 8, 32. You shall know what? The truth. And the truth shall set you free. And for those that have my last coaching video, group coaching on uncertainty, and I still get into entropy, and I get into information theory, and the focus is about uncertainty and feeling times of uncertainty, you have to watch it. It is absolutely phenomenal. And so, in our lives, we can feel uncertain at times about what we're called to. Hey, Paula, God bless you. And hey, Dina, I love you so good. I talked to you just a little bit ago. So good to see you, sister. I love you. And so in times of your life, you can feel uncertain, just like I was back in the late 1990s as I was in a storm. And this storm seemed to mark me of divorce, this storm of uncertainty. Where am I going? What is going to happen? Thank you, Dina. What does God have for me? When you think that your life is a certain way, and all of a sudden, it seems like all the things that you had thought before are just uprooted like a tree in a storm that's uprooted and turned over and you see its roots, then you're wondering again, okay, God, what is it that you have for me in life? What is my portion? We're going to look at that in great measure today through Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And it's so interesting that it's almost springtime because we're doing a new thing springs forth as it says in scripture in Isaiah 43, 19, where, where God says, behold, I do something new. Now shall it spring forth. So we're going to look at Isaiah 43, 19, Jeremiah 29. Amen. So let's look at Isaiah 43, and we're going to look at verse 19. And I'm also going to get the Strong's Concordance pulled up, and God is going to unpack some of this scripture. Hey, Deborah, he's going to unpack the scripture for you so that you have understanding. Amen. Faith comes by understanding the word, the very message spoken off the lips of Christ Jesus. I think that's Romans 10, 19, or it might be 14. Let me find out. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. I keep saying it over and over and over. I should know it. Romans 10, 17. I had the right chapter, just the wrong verse. 17 means consecration, so now I'll remember it. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing the word, the very message spoken off the lips of Christ Jesus. Amen. And so the word of God will always point in the gospel to a teaching or teachings by Christ Jesus. Faith comes, that word faith actually in Greek means understanding. Understanding comes by hearing the word. Now remember, you're not going to totally understand it in your mind. You're going to feel it in your second brain, which is your belly. And in that belly area, it's going to witness to you. And you're going to have a witness to it in your spirit. God bless you, Amy. Love you. You're going to have a witness to it in your spirit. How does that look like? How does it feel like? A witness to your spirit is peace, shalom. There's just a calmness, a wholeness. There is a rest where you feel your soul is at rest. That Hebrews 4, amen, that seventh day rest and so God's shalom rules your heart. Scripture says, let me get you a bunch of scriptures because I always do scriptures. Let his peace rule your heart. That scripture is Colossians 3, 15, that God's peace, what? Rules our heart. It governs. It guides. It directs. And so one of the things that I always tell people when I'm doing coaching or mentoring or whatever it is I'm doing or teaching 
preaching, treaching, what I tell them is the litmus test to the will of the Father is that you'll have peace in your heart. You'll just have a shalom. Although you cannot see where you're going and you're just needing to take that next step, although it seems crazy, it doesn't make sense, you're just going to have a peace and you're going to be able to take that next step. God's peace rules your heart also, God's peace surpasses all understanding, and that's Philippians 4, 7, right before verse 8, about whatever's true, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good report, think on these things. So, God's peace surpasses your understanding, where initially you would be hesitant to take the next step because your logical mind wants to argue with what you've known in your, amen, Liz, and I, God's been having me, waking me up, praying for him. I kid you not. I kid you not. And so, I've, uh, when you're hesitant about taking the next step, and in the natural, it just seems illogical, it doesn't make sense, other people think it's strange, and you haven't seen other people do what you're about to do, well, God's ways are higher than our ways. You're welcome, Liz. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his peace just gives us a confidence, a hope, an expectancy. Because remember, whenever you have hope, you always have expectancy. And hope in Hebrew is tikva, and it means a cord. And I think of it, I always think about cords in the belly like in biblical cord, <clears throat> and I talk about cords in great detail in God's fall, in my teaching series of the keys of the kingdom on my YouTube channel, and there's seven in the series, and it is the most powerful teaching I've ever seen done on the keys of the kingdom and really brings understanding, wisdom, and knowledge about the keys of the kingdom. And so when we think about hope, we're thinking about being fed the thoughts of God. Now, I get into Rev 22.2, where I talk about it's the first book of the Watchmen series. And I think it was actually the seventh or eighth book that I, workbook that I wrote for the Watchmen series. But God wanted me to bring that out first in book form on Amazon, <clears throat> where I get into Tesla, Tesla's inventions, where I bring in scripture that has some of the elements that Tesla's inventions has to really show you why God had those elements in some of his creatures and the power that happens when you get those specific elements together. I get into frequencies and I get into Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 and about us knowing the thoughts of God. That still small voice. Now remember, our spirit man is in our belly, and Holy Spirit is in our belly, and I really break all of that down in God's firewall healing of the soul, session two, the wind, where I get into the Old Testament and the New Testament, breaking all of this down, and that is also the location of our second brain, which is our gut, our stomach, which is the second largest place of neurons, a repository. That is why God put that repository of neurons in your belly. And when you have a gut instinct, it is because that is where your spirit man is. And because we are in salvation, our spirit is born from above. Our spirit has 2 Timothy 1, 7, power, love, and a sound mind. That is our new spirit. That is the new creation and we're going to also see this with scripture as Isaiah 43, 19, that God is doing a new thing and it springs forth. Are we able to perceive it? Are we able to understand it? Because it's going to come as our new creation spirit, our spirit born from above with Holy Spirit communicate this to our second brain, which is part of of our soul. I get into different books about part of our soul in scripture 
which is that soul being revealed with the connection of the mind, the heart, and the belly. And that divine creation where we are fearfully and wonderfully made, where God is able to bring forth that Philippians 2.12 grace of us working out our salvation in fear and trembling. So let's look at Isaiah 43.19, and we're going to get to Jeremiah 29 in just a minute. Scripture says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. So you're uncertain. You've been through a storm. You're now reframing that storm, the name, whether it's divorce, hopelessness, depression, the loss of a loved one, dis-ease, whatever it is. You rename that storm to where it has no power over you. That that word is devalued. It has no strength. And so, instead of divorce, you would say something like, I'm married because scripture says in Isaiah 54 that my creator is my husband. Scripture says also, good afternoon, Patricia, I love you. Scripture also says that my land is married. My person is married. Scripture also says that I am going to sit at the marriage supper of the lamb as I hold on to that faith, working out my salvation, fear and trembling, and I endure to the end, that I will be at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. And so that's just an example about reframing your storm to where it has no strength over you. And you give your season a new name. People might be saying, oh, Robin, that's just hodgepodge. Well, we're, there is power in the mouth. There is power in what you speak. What you speak is the evidence of what's going on in the mind and body connection. Romans 12, 1, make a decisive dedication over your body, consecrated as holy, as unto God, and be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so, before I got delivered from alcoholism, before, oh my goodness, I feel the anointing. I know y'all do too. Amen, Liz. Oh my goodness. Before... I saw it in the natural. There was an expectancy, a hope, a stirring in my belly. And I was still bound to alcoholism. This was leading up to my deliverance on Resurrection Sunday, 2002, when the power of God came on me and set me free. And I was trembling under the power of God. And everybody was looking at me. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I look like a fool. What is happening to me? Because I had never experienced this power that was on my person. I just knew that I felt this strength, like massive power, where I was plugged in to massive voltage. This is the only way I can describe it. And this power was surging through me. And as it surged through me, and my knees were weak and rich, and I just got married pretty much, and he was looking at me like, what is going on with my wife? I was thinking, what is going on with my body? What is this? Because I had never seen anything like I was experiencing. I had been in the Baptist church and now I was in a place where Holy Spirit baptism was really being stirred up in my members as God was drawing me closer to Him in repentance, as I was seeking Him, as I was having expectancy. And I got delivered, and I felt a strength pulling me up. And all the shackles of spiritual dis-ease with addiction, with alcohol... It was broken like that. But before that, okay, before the deliverance, before the manifestation of power, before the manifestation of promise, I stepped out in faith, speaking the word because God said, Robin, I want you to speak these scriptures, and it was Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13, with I have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Hey, Suzanne, I love you. And I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. And I was an alcoholic at this time. But I was drawing near to God. I would still go to church, 
anytime the church doors were open and I was a single mom, now married to rich newlyweds, and I still had a bondage. But God told me, he said, Robin, I want you to rename your season. And I was like, glory to God, what is it? He said, it is, I am not a drunk. I went, what? I am not a drunk. He said, yes, that's your new season. I am not a drunk. And everybody around me knew that I was a drunk. And at that time, I was drinking 12 beers a day, at least, at least, every day, every day. It, 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 so, Monday through Sunday, I was so bound up. And I got bound up when I was a single mother. And I got angry with God. And I backslid and I turned to alcohol to medicate my pain and it became my bondage. And God said, Robin, I want you to speak. I am not a drunk. And I'm like, okay, God, but it doesn't make sense, but I'll do it anyway. And so I began to say that and even Rich would be around me and I would say, I'm not a drunk. He said, yes, you are. You're a drunk. I said, no, I'm not because <clears throat> nowhere in scripture does it say that Jesus Christ was a drunk and he was not a drunk I, even though other people thought he was he hung around them but you know what that's their opinion other people's opinions don't matter amen that's on them and that's between them and god and god said and because you have the mind of christ and jesus was not a drunk you're not a drunk and so i would constantly say that i'm not a drunk i have the mind of christ jesus was not a drunk and because Jesus was not a drunk, and I have the mind of Christ, and I'm the righteousness of Christ Jesus, I don't care what my symptoms look like. I'm not a drunk either. And I just kept speaking it, and there was an expectancy stirring in my members. And that's what Isaiah 43, 19 resembles with Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. Because it's saying there is expectancy. There's a hope. There's something about to appear in your present. Do you perceive it? Do you perceive that the storm is over? And God is bringing a new season. It's a season of truth. It's a season of freedom. Amen. Woo, I'm getting excited. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And that wilderness represents the trying, the testing, the scorching, the fiery trials, the tribulations, the testing. And God says, okay, you've been in that wilderness. You've been in that bondage long enough. But I'm about to bring rivers, hallelujah, of living water in your midst. John 4, that well of living water, Jesus, the word, Rivers of living water, life and life abundantly. That's also in Isaiah 35, where the rose of Sharon blooms, where? In the wilderness, in the desert. But all of a sudden, God brings living waters in that dry place. Because you know you're thirsty, hallelujah. You miss your thirst, just like God told me many years ago when I taught on Job. In God's firewall healing of the soul. And God had me unpack Job 28, Job 29. And most of the Hebrew in Job 28 of most of those verses. And God told me, he said, Robin, you've got tap water in your kitchen right now. And if you were thirsty, you would know you're thirsty. But it wouldn't be a big deal. And I said, okay. He said, but if you were in the wilderness, if you were in the desert. And you had no water. He said, you would know your need for water. If you hadn't had water for two days, you would know that you missed it. You would acknowledge and recognize that you once had it. And now you realize that you didn't appreciate it before. And now you miss what you had before. He said, that's how my servant Job was. My servant Job had my counsel over his tent, but because, and even though Job was the most righteous man in the land, we cannot hold him up to this particular pillar, this 
lofty place because he's still man. Amen. There's only one perfect man. And just like the prophet Isaiah, he had to have an encounter with God in Isaiah 6. And even though Isaiah was a righteous man, what does Isaiah say? When the love of God and the holiness of God came upon him, he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And so Job didn't realize what he truly had before until this season of trying and testing, until the wilderness. And in that wilderness, Job now recounts in Job 29, 